Avalon Hill, along with Atomic Games, has released the third in its World at War series entitled D-Day America Invades, a very successful integration of simple gameplay and sophistication. It doesn't try to go all out in the area of graphics like Steel Panthers did, and it doesn't try to overwhelm with attack tables and modifiers as was the case in Empire 2. What it does is hit right in the middle, providing a good-looking game that has depth that hardcore gamers are always looking for. But don't expect D-Day to be new and innovative. It's a very well put together strategy war game that doesn't try to bring anything new to the genre, but incorporates all of the best features from all of the best games. D-Day America Invades lets the player be in command of the invasion of Normandy. By playing either the Allied or Axis commander in any of the seven scenarios, I guess you could say that there are 14 scenarios to play, but even that's not a great amount. Well, some of those scenarios could take quite a while to get through, but more scenarios would have been a real plus, not to mention a scenario editor or a random battle generator. But the lack of scenarios is really this game's only problem. The game itself plays like any other hex-based strategy war game. Both sides give orders to their troops, then you watch as your orders are carried out. Each turn represents four hours in the day, with two turns being at night and the other four turns occurring during the day. After the orders are given to the troops for a turn, the action occurs in a simultaneous style, meaning that both armies execute their orders at the same time instead of one army moving before the other. D-Day puts ground, air, and naval units at your disposal. And the genius of this game is how the designers have taken some pretty sophisticated features and developed them into a system that's both fun and easy to use. Ground units actually have two commands to go by on each turn. The primary command concerns that unit's movement or combat. If a unit is moving, you decide how quickly or cautiously it's going to move, and if it's attacking, you decide how intense the attack is to be. The secondary command deals with the defensive posture of the unit. So if it's attacked, the unit is told whether to defend itself, retreat, or hold its ground at all costs. Air units are a little more simplistic in design. By calling up the aircraft menu, you're presented with all the aircraft that are ready to go. But you don't have to be an expert on the types and models of planes that participated in the invasion. What you're presented with is a list of the kinds of missions the planes are used for. So if you want a heavy bombing mission, you choose from the bomber's menu. And if you need some reconnaissance performed, you simply pick from the recon menu. Some hardcore gamers may grumble at the fact that this is not as realistic as it could have been, but it manages to keep the game rolling along at an enjoyable pace, and you don't have to keep crawling through the manual to check on what model of plane can do what kind of mission. Naval units are much like aircraft, but are probably the most simplistic units to deal with. Actually, you don't have any control over the naval units except for fire control. The ships sit offshore, but you can't move them around. All you can do is choose a ship to fire and a target you want it to fire at. But where the aircraft had different kinds of missions to perform, the only difference between the types of naval units available is how far inland their fire can reach. They are limited in ammo and leave the game for a few turns while getting resupplied, but you can't control any of those functions. You just use them for artillery support, which is the function they performed in the actual invasion. All of the good strategy wargaming stuff is included in D-Day, and then some. Basics, like keeping lines of supply open, are here to keep track of. You can also reattach units to new headquarters when you move them too far away from their current HQ. There's also replacements, fortifications to build, and weather which affects the battle. And gameplay favorites like zones of control, terrain modifiers, leadership modifiers, fatigue, and disorganization values are all thrown in. And when you want the individual commanders to roll with the punches, you can let the PC control some of your individual units and they'll react to whatever the enemy does, just issue your standing orders and they'll react accordingly. But don't think that just because this game is accessible by folks who aren't the hardest of hardcore gamers that grognards are going to find it boring. There are plenty of combat tables and unit attribute modifiers to keep the serious gamers happy. The manual has details on how the computer is deciding the combat odds and outcomes of all the battles, so you can do some heavy-duty war computations while playing the game. For example, this is a passage straight out of the manual, and I quote, if more than two-thirds of a hex's stacking limit is assigned to attack, the attack is conducted using the fraction of the total attack strength that corresponds to two-thirds of the stacking limit, usually six-sevenths, three-fourths, or two-thirds for seven, eight, and nine stacking points, respectively." Unquote. Now, if you didn't understand that, or just don't care, that's fine because you'll have a great time playing the game without worrying about all the fine details like that. The point is, for people who do care about it, it's all there to play with. The great thing about this game is how the in-depth strategy war game features have been combined into a system that's fun and easy to use. The interface is the keystone holding all of this together. It presents all of this information in an easy-to-use-and-understand system, 
but you'll probably need to keep the manual close by for the first couple of games to find out what the heck all of those numbers mean. But this is a surprisingly good game. This genre has been done to death by all of the games on the market these days. But kudos to Avalon Hill for knowing a good game when they see it. Just keep in mind that this game focuses not on the events coming after the invasion, but on the invasion itself. Which is probably the reason for the limited number of scenarios. Folks who love World War II games will be thoroughly satisfied with this game. Even people who just like a good strategy or war game will find this to be a great game. It's a very, very good product that new players will be able to grow into and advanced gamers won't soon grow tired of.